Okay. So let's start with the lecture. First of all, what are our goals in this course? We want to examine the concept of non-networking, how it came into existence. Why do we have this new topic? Okay. Uh, it's just because that, as academicians, we want to uh, create new fields uh, in which we can uh, present, uh, publish more papers, or is there really a need for this? Uh, we need to provide a proper definition of nanoscale networking. We should be able to outline some of the driving forces behind this new field and provide an introduction to the techniques that can be used to enable nano networking between these nano devices in this very new field of research. Uh, so, chapter one will be an overview of the concepts of nano networking, and that's what we're, we have just started at the moment. In the following three chapters, we'll be talking about these topics. Chapters two and three are closely related. Chapter two is mostly on communication inside the cell, typically making use of molecular motors which doesn't make any sense for you probably at the moment. And chapter three will be about communication between cells. In other words, intracell communication, where we are going to talk about uh, ion signaling, specifically calcium signaling, and also diffusion-based communications. Uh, in the other chapter, in the last chapter, the topic is carbon nanotube networks. Our mo most of our focus will be on chapters two and three. We'll be focusing on here, on these uh, two topics, mainly because my research is focused here, actually. But the technology on carbon nanotubes is not something to be disregarded. There's some important research going on also in here, which actually can be attached to What's being done here? So molecular communications and carbon nanotube networks can also be used together. That's why we'll be slightly also touching the topic of carbon nanotube networks. But as I said, our focus will be here. Note that these are not the only ways of nanocommunications. There are also other methods like, there are also quantum networks, whatever, but we'll not be going into that detail. It's not that they're not important things, but that will not be our focus, okay? So although the course says nano-networking, we'll of course be focusing on parts of it. We cannot cover everything in a single semester. So what is, what is the thing about these nanotechnology and nano-networks? It's actually the intersection of two worlds. There's a world based on nanotechnologies as an emerging technology. People are trying to, uh, researchers are trying to build nano devices using nanotechnology. And nanotechnology is used in various ways. People are uh, making use of nanotechnology to, for example, uh, produce paints for the walls based on nanotechnology, or clothing based on nanotechnology. For example, clothes that will not pass the heat, for example, for the firemen. Uh, or, uh, for the astronauts, uh, but there is also the other world, the human world, that needs this technology. So there are things going on in the human scale, like this remote control for the projector, but there are also things going in the nanoscale, and somehow these things need to interact. There will be some nano-networking but whatever is being done in the nanoscale somehow has to be reflected to the human scale. If not, it's totally useless. If it remains all in the nanoscale, well, we are not in the nanoscale. I cannot see what's going on. Okay, so somehow, whatever has been sensed or done in the nanoscale has to be reflected to me, to my scale. So there is some, uh, the need for also communication between these. But there is definitely a need for communication between the devices in the nanoscale. So 
It's an intersection of two worlds, nano and human scale. Uh, you need to look at things in uh, network and communication theory, and uh, this will require a change in the concept of networking. In the course, we'll review the state of the art in uh, nano networking. Note that this is not a nanotechnology course. We are not trying to build the devices. We're looking at encodes. Given some nano devices, how can they communicate? How can I transport information from one nano device to another, or to multiple nano devices, of course? So we'll review the state of the art and then look at the challenges and implications and research opportunities, of course, in biological networking and nanotube interconnections. As I said, there are more like quantum networks, but we'll not go into those. Is this course real? Is there really something as nano networks? Well, not at the moment, of course, but there is really need for this. IEEE has realized that this is the future. Research should be done on this topic, and there should be a group working on the standards. So IEEE has started 1906.1 working group on uh, nano-networking, uh, nanoscale, and molecular communications, of which I'm a member. And this group happens to be led by the author of, this, of your textbook, Steve Bush. And this group regularly has a meeting every month, typically in the first or the second uh, Monday uh, of the uh, month. Uh, this group, last, uh, in the last meeting, which was on September 10th, has finalized the definition of non-networking. So according to this finalized uh, definition, a nanonetwork is, pay attention, a human designed system for communication at or with the nanoscale using physical principles that are suited to nanoscale systems. The key word here is human designed. The reason for this keyword, for having this keyword in the definition, is as follows. In the nature, there are already nano devices and nano events. There is actually nano communications going on. If you wonder where it is, just look at the mirror. Your body is actually using nano communications. You have your cells in the body, and the cells are communicating with each other. Look at your immune system. When an external uh, intruder enters the body, actually what your immune system does is, with the communication, it det first detects this intruder, and then using communications, it organizes the immune system cells to attack this intruder and resolve the problem. There is really no, no communications going on. There is no communications going on in your body at the moment. You're seeing me. Because there is, uh, your eyes are acquiring the image, but then this information is being transported. It's a very short distance, but it's being transported to your brain. And also inside your brain, there's some communication going on between the neurons to decide what this is. That's how you realize all of these letters or my face. Similar with your ears and all your senses. So there is already nanocommunications in your body. That's not the only way. Nanocommunications is working everywhere inside the nature. The problem is it's not human controlled. We observe that it's happening, but at the moment, I'm not able to say, well, this nano device, or nano thing, let me say in general, should send 
a one or zero to this one. Okay, actually I should correct it. Yes, we were able to do it, but at a very small scale. We'd like to uh, develop some mechanisms to do this in a better manner. Okay, so that's what we mean by human designed. It should be human designed and human controlled. Naturally happening things are, yes, they're nanocommunications, but it's not a concern of this working group because it's not useful for us. So the human design means a system that occurs as a result of conscious human intervention. And the nanoscale, this has also been a great discussion, uh, what nanoscale means. But the final decision is that Nanoscale refers to dimensions of less than 100 nanometers, 100 or less. We were also discussing whether we should take it up to 1,000, but the final decision was this way, at least for the moment. Uh, sorry. Uh, one of the other important things is when you have a means of communication that means of communication may have multiple dimensions. The device, uh, the, the antenna, uh, the physical entity that is being used for transporting information, whatever it is, like for the case of molecular communications, that would be a molecule. It might have multiple dimensions, and some of these dimensions might violate this limit. It might be more than 100 nanometers. But at least in one dimension, it should be less than 100 nanometers. So if I just throw this remote control as a way of communications, if I throw it to become, it's one. If not, it is zero. That's a way of communication. But it's not nano, because in none of the dimensions, this is less than 100 nanometers. But if I throw him, let's say, a carbon nanotube, which is longer than 100 nanometers, but in the diameter, it is less than 100 nanometers, and throwing that carbon nanotube is one, otherwise it's zero, then that would be nanocommunication. Okay? And the reason for allowing some dimensions to exceed this limit is the reason that we need to communicate between nano devices. That will be typically in nanoscale, that's obvious. But we need to communicate between the devices in the nanoscale and those in the higher scales, like MEMS or higher, okay? So you might need some of the dimensions to be out of this, these bounds, but at least one of them should be in those bounds. As we said, networks communicating uh, in the nanoscale already exist in the nature. Interconnected carbon, uh, not only in uh, the nature, of course, also in the labs. Interconnected carbon nanotubes, micrometers, uh, micrometers in length and nanometers in diameter. These convey actually signals across areas of tens of square micrometers. Well, this technology is actually currently in use uh, for uh, microprocessor designs. Okay. The current micro, uh, microprocessor design is uh, at around 32 nanometers. Okay, so we are actually doing something today. It's not that far. Okay, but we'd like to have better ways of doing this. Wireless transmission and reception among the components of a single chip have already been designed and they have been patented because they're, as I said, actually being used as of today. Now, consider the impact of 
the extreme differences between today's networks and the nanoscale networks. Let's just look at this figure and it will be more obvious. It's not very visible. <laughs> this is not visible with the projector, I'm sorry. But uh, here you have a mode in the sensor networks, which is something like half the size of this. Those of you working in NetLab should have already seen us using the uh, sensors of this size. And they can, we also have smaller of these. Uh, and the carbon nanotubes, it's not very visible. I have a better figure later on in the slides. You'll see it there. Uh, these are several nanometers in radius, but could be much longer. Now, if you look at the difference in size between these two technologies, carbon nanotubes or nanoscale technology and the current technology, this ratio is similar to the Brooklyn Bridge, the ratio between the Brooklyn Bridge and uh, the tip of your uh, finger. That is the ratio in the size. Okay. So this is greater than 500 meters. This is around, uh, your finger is around, uh, the tip is around three centimeters, whereas this is uh, several micrometers, and this is around 55 millimeters in size. Thus, clearly, it's much easier to manipulate and replace the components in today's internet using the nanotechnology. Uh, so, what are the challenges? The network components of the nano network uh, are on the same scale as individual molecules of the sensed elements. Uh, can you just do that? Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry. So, the components that are being used for sensing in the nanoscale are at almost at the same size with the things you're trying to sense. That's very important. If you're trying to sense individual molecules with larger devices, you will have difficulties. Like, consider a uh, nuclear, biological, or chemical attack. Let's forget the nuclear side. Just let's look at, for example, a chemical attack in this room. If you try to put a regular sensor for which I will have a, a picture later on. If you try to detect a chemical attack with such a sensor, before the sensor can detect the existence of such a dangerous chemical in the room, everybody in this room will have died. So you have the alarm, but everyone is dead already. Okay? But if you try to do it at the nanoscale, it's easier to detect even individual chemicals, individual molecules, because the regular sensors typically look at the uh, concentration of that chemical in the environment and has to go beyond some threshold for the device to raise an alarm. Whereas in the case of nanotechnology, you can detect single molecules. Thus, if you see even the existence of a single molecule in the environment, you can immediately start the alarm. Okay? And actually, this approach is already being used uh, today for uh, the case of nanosensors. Uh, but one important thing in that case is that you would have typically many, many such uh, nanosensors. So managing so many devices together, that would also pose a new uh, problem. Uh, the problems are twofold. So the significant increase in the complexity of the nanoscale systems due to the large number of components, the large number of sensors, for example, 
uh, within a compact space is one challenge, and the other is a mismatch in the size of the networking components, and also you need to uh, make them individually uh, more difficult to detect and handle. One other problem is the possible attacks to your nanoscale networks. Network itself could be under attack. So the attackers may try to utilize the nature of both the small scale and the uh, strong relationship with the fundamental physical objects. Like the real viruses in the biological systems may cause a problem for molecular communication systems. So in uh, computer science, we used to mean something else for virus. Now we still we revert back and start talking about the real viruses now. Eavesdropping might be important. Uh, so you can do eavesdropping by tapping the uh, non-scale network with the attacker's network sensors at the same invisible scale. You have your nanoscale network and the enemy attacks with nano devices. How do you detect those enemy nano devices? It's more difficult to realize them. The denial of service can be done by flooding the nanoscale networks with physical matter. Just send many of them, and that will end up with a denial of service. And careful and controlled faults in the physical nature uh, of the network can be created to corrupt the integrity of the information also. So some of these uh, challenges, are, of course, uh, they exist also in the uh, regular networks. Solutions from the macro scale networking can be proposed uh, for use in on-chip networks. We have a technology called network on-chip, or in short, NOC. Uh, the implementations may, uh, for the routers are in different ways, as you know. We have packet or circuit switching, which is the regular thing you know, what you learn in CMP 475. There's dynamic or static scheduling that you also have discussed up to now. But there's also things, concepts like wormhole or virtual cut routing, virtual cut through routing. So in the case of wormhole routing, uh, what you have is you have large network packets, but you chop them into very small pieces. And these are now called flits which stands for the flow control digits. Now, the header flit has information about, actually, the destination, where it is trying to go. Okay? And the header flit goes first, finding its way throughout the network towards the destination. And as it is crawling through the network, it's setting up the route for the subsequent flits that are carrying the information itself. Okay, and the information flits are just going behind the header flit. Now, the header flit is so small that, since it's small, it can be easily uh, decoded and the network can uh, process it uh, in a fast manner. So as the header flit and the subsequent data flits are flowing, it looks like a worm crawling through the network. That's why it's called uh, wormhole routing. And the tail fit, which is at the very end, is actually doing the bookkeeping operation. It's just closing the path as it's going. Okay? So the head flit finds the path, the tail is closing the path. So the wormhole implies the way the packets are being sent, as I said, the address in the header fillet is short, so it can be translated before the real data itself is coming. It's not like you have to receive the whole packet and then you process the header. Just see the header, immediately decide what to do, and the subsequent ones, okay, you're with the header fillet, just go that way. You don't touch it. The router can quickly set up the routing and then get out of business. Does not touch it anymore. 
And the packet may occupy several flits. As I said, this way it looks like a worm. And cut-through routing is similar in concept. We'll not go into that. Uh, for the case of uh, network on chip research, the majority of the implementations for routing on the chip are based on packet switched or synchronous networks. But some of these network on chip uh, topologies and architectures maybe uh, are actually uh, injecting data into the network, not through one NIC. Remember, NIC was the actual interface into the network. It's not using a single NIC, but they're using, for example, four sub-NICs to allow for faster transmission. So this way, you achieve significant improvements in latency, because you're able to send faster. And it also helps in energy consu uh, consumption uh, in a very small area and uh, with complexity. If you have mesh networking topologies on the chip, in that case, the, uh, this scheme can provide substantial savings in area and also in uh, the number of chip, uh, on-chip routers that are required. Well, unfortunately, when the number of chips that are to be produced is huge, then you have to find a solution. The production of such chips might uh, um, uh, bring a problem to you. Also, when you try to look at the interconnections with among so many chips, that's yet another problem. So in the long term, not as of today, but in the long term, it would be best if these devices are self-assembling. What does that mean? Well, it means just let it produce itself. You put the device, and it produces more components and also organizes for the communication in between. If you can do this, that would be great, right? Well, this is actually what's going on in nature. You just put a few fish in a lake, and the fish are self-assembling, let me say. They're reproducing and they're communicating in between. It's better than producing somehow in the factory uh, or in the lab environment thousands of fish and then putting them in the lake. Can we do this with the current technologies? So if you can do that, that would be wonderful. And some of the links uh, also in such a complex environment where you have many, many components, some of these links uh, might be such that now these processing elements cannot work on a single clock cycle. The chip properties might lead to many errors. These errors could be transient, intermittent, or permanent communication errors. You have to also cope with this. It's not like uh, you produce something and then you keep on using it. I'm sorry, uh, the yes. chip you are talking about here uh, is not a regular chip that we know, right? Well, ex exclude that uh, self-assembly part I mentioned. If you don't have that feature, yes, it's, uh, it is similar to the chips you already know. Uh, they're produced using nanotechnology, but the chips uh, you're using inside your laptop are also being produced with nanotechnology. So uh, the chips you already know are already using nanotechnology. You mean you want us, uh, are they alive? Uh, if you, okay, if you're asking whether the components are alive, uh, not as of today. I was asking, could it be possible in the future? But not as of today. The ones we're at the moment discussing are electronic components. 
but you might have variations in the future, which are biological components. That's what we're trying to come at, actually. So as he said, there might be uh, errors in the system, but you don't want to throw out the chip when there's an error. Although there might be errors, the chip should be able to function. It should still be able to function. The dimensions are, the dimensions we are discussing are very small, uh, which will create problems in the distribution of a reliable clock signal throughout the chip. And such uncertainty will bring more problems in the communication for on-chip technology. So there are th these are the things that should be attacked. There are two major research thrust areas here. One is the design, simulation, control, and coordination of robots. Sorry, uh, this is uh, about nanorobotics. Sorry, I didn't realize that we went into the other subject here. In the case of nanorobotics, there are two uh, research areas that are focused at the moment. One is the design, simulation, control, and coordination of the robots in the nanoscale dimensions. And the other one is the overall miniaturization of these uh, robots into micrometer sizes. Of course, if the overall robot is in micrometer size, the individual components ha need to be in the nanometer size. And the objects with overall dimensions at or below uh, micrometer range should be utilized. 